Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about classical stuff, the ancient world, uh, classical education, teaching, old things, brought to you by three guys who are into that stuff. Yep. Yep. That's us. That's my dearest homies. Oh. We are gathered here today okay. for another episode of oh, Classical sorry. Stuff You okay. Should Know. Sure. Um, yeah, we are. We've been. This is a podcast. We've been around for a little while now. We uh, and um, we just nearing episode one hundred. Nearing what episode one hundred? We crazy? actually just had a little, a little powwow trying to figure out what to do for episode one hundred. Haven't quite figured it out yet. If anybody has uh, any suggestions, hey, you can always email us. Mm-hmm. Um, but my name is Graham Donaldson, and I am a teacher at a school called Veritas Academy in Austin, Texas. It is a classical Christian school. And my, I am here with my two colleagues, Arthur Jan Hannenberg. That's me. Lovingly known as AJ. Mm-hmm. Lovingly. Or and also, respectfully known Also respectfully as known as Lord Hannenberg. As Lord Hannenberg. Yeah. And Thomas Fletcher Magby. Hello. Known as Bees. Yes. Um, Not, neither lovingly nor respectfully. No, 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 no. It <laughs> okay. is just known. I mean, just is there known. a term that encompasses both love and respect? And if so, N- that no. is the term that I use when I say bees. Much appreciated. Um. Today, we are going to be learning about, um, like, childhood development toys, especially, like, building things out of, um, uh, out yeah. of like, a, like, a dough, kind of like, a, a, pla- soft, like yeah, a soft, yeah. malleable yeah. substance. Usually in pretty funny colors, yeah, maybe, it's like, great. a green. It's or salty. A, yeah, I'm sorry, um, what? But, so, um, it is a little salty. But you can, Why have you all tasted well, this? Well, when I was a kid, my mom uh, didn't want to buy, uh, she thought that Play-Doh that you bought, like, from the store was mm-hmm. not, was A, expensive, and right. B, potentially toxic. Right. This was the 90s. And um, and she figured that she could probably make her own okay. uh, with just water and salt to stop it from going bad. I so lots more, of salt there, there must and be more then tempting. flour. Oh, thank you. Okay. And something else. Okay. I mean, I'm sure there was some sort of, like, binding agent. Mm-hmm. So we had homemade natural Play-Doh that you could eat, mm-hmm. but it was really super salty. So in my mind, Play-Doh is, is just, like, this salty uh, green dough. Um, My mom used to do the same, do the same thing. Really? She would make to homemade make Play-Doh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, homemade Play-Doh. And maybe this is like what got us started on the classical education. Maybe no, this is I've like never, the missing link. I've never had but I think homemade Play-Doh. She was really focused on taste for the kids, so it was mm-hmm. like a peanut butter base That's with so some other things. It was actually pretty tasty. No. But oh, maybe, not the greatest, <clears throat> maybe not the greatest actual Play-Doh. Oh, there you go. Yeah. But it's also like you... You use your hands with it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gross. You don't want to eat it, yeah. And but, then you put it away and you play with it again the next day. Well, when you're a kid, you're putting your hands in your mouth anyway. It's not... <sighs> yeah. You're anyway, just, yeah. So... <laughs> you're just bringing in an intermediary. There's no, no real So, change. AJ, teach us about Play-Doh. Okay. So, we are talking about Play-Doh today, not the malleable goo stuff that you played with when you were a kid. Oh, I, but, mis- I misread the, the oh. notes. But the okay. philosopher from ancient days of yore. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so... I'm going to start quick with uh, with a brief overview of his life. I'm going to do just terrible justice to that and do a really bad job of it. And then we'll move on to book one of Plato, of Plato's Republic. So I, I re- originally intended this to be a six episode series. Hot dang. Wow. Going through Plato's Republic. I don't think I can do it in less than 12. Whoa. <laughs> which, which means we might give up halfway through or one or two yeah, in. That being said, you did promise us like a 12 parter with Canterbury Tales. <laughs> <laughs> I sure did. And did I deliver? You sure no. did. Yeah. <laughs> Are you done with Canterbury Tales? Uh, we keep getting listeners asking for it, which is a surefire message that it will probably never happen. Okay, <laughs> great. Good. Aww. So, uh, so, so I'm going to keep on trying to do this. Unless you send $10 to classical stuff. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I guess we're nearing episode 12 on Plantagenets though. So we have episode some long... seven. Okay. Yeah. 12. That's what I said. Yeah. I figure play like Plato's Republic is important enough it's that true. it deserves it does. real yeah. attention. Yeah. And I started reading through it and I'm like, I can do two books in an episode. And I was like, I cannot do two, <laughs> two books in an episode. One book is oof, more than enough to handle. So. Well, let's start with Plato. He was born sometime between 429 and 423 BC to an aristocratic family uh, to, if I can read my handwriting, Ariston (laughs) and Perictione. Sure. And this was just after the golden age of Athens. So right after Pericles died, I think they actually died the same year. So Plato was born and Pericles kicked it. And if you, if you, as a listener, don't know Pericles, you can go back and listen to uh, several episodes ago. We talked about him. Um, the and funeral oration is that that guy? Yeah, I think his funeral oration. He had he was the youngest of four. He had two older brothers and one older sister. And the two older brothers actually show up a ton in the Republic. He uses them as characters a bunch. And he also does that with the rest of his family. Like his uncles will show up and his cousins. Apparently, he had a good family life. His father died in childhood. His mom remarried. And his actual the the name Plato comes from Platon, which means broad, and that can be referring to three different things. 
You guys have any guesses? Big old forehead? I was going to say the exact same thing. Big old forehead. <laughs> Big Come old on. forehead. Come That's on. option number three. What are the other two? Um, uh, his, his broad his, knowledge of the ancient yeah, world. Like his sort of interests. Yeah. Uh, broad eloquence. So uh, close. Yeah, and nice. chest and shoulders. Apparently. <laughs> oh, really? Apparently he's he like a beefy rip, dude. Rip? Yeah. Wow, okay, he used to one. wrestle when he was oh, young. Man, more like so. Slato. <laughs> So embarrassing. Oh my word. Oh my so we got we got a review. Well, I got more listeners. Aris, I was, hold Aris on. Throttle. Aris, well, wait, no, we're talking about Plato. No, come oh, on. Wait, sorry. hold on. No, I, we got a review, li- listeners, and I feel like we just got a because I've been conscious of it the whole time after hearing about it. You, you guys want to say what it says? Is it the one that I just read? To you? Yeah. Oh, it's, huh? my, it's like my, it's my favorite review. It's a three star review that we got. Uh, not too long ago. I'm trying to fill time as I... This isn't awkward. This is gold. No, this is 100% the most awkward thing that any of us do. Oh. All right. So this review, I'm still pulling it up, guys. This is taking an embarrassment. All right. Anyway, as he takes time, we'll come back to it. Okay, got it. See? <laughs> yeah, they're classical reviews. You should know. Uh, so the title of it is Classics Guys. I just love the Classics Guys. Sorry. That's us. They are funny... That's air quotes. They are funny, awkward, not funny, haha. But their enthusiasm <laughs> for the subject matter is undeniable. <laughs> sort of funny, awkward. I take umbrage. Anyway. It is, the, it is the 100% the most accurate review we have received. I don't think we're awkward. I 100% think we are. Anyway. I, now that I think about it, like if I just, I'm just feeling it through the whole thing. Anyway, so Platon means broad. His true name was Aristocles. And Ambrose, you guys know Ambrose? From a lot. Yeah. It's like the Ambrose, Ambrose, yeah. Yeah, Ambrose yeah. thought that Plato at one point went down to Egypt and met Jeremiah. Hmm. And really? yeah, have, like oh, Jeremiah. Do you have a reason for that? Or you just Um I I forget. Okay. I think that Augustine was like, maybe, but probably not. Okay. And it turned I, I think the dates are a little weird. So if he did, it was probably in his teen years. Uh-huh. And the all in all likelihood, he was like, that guy's ridiculous. Okay. So Probably didn't meet and get a lot of influence, but it's kind of cool. Yeah. He was really well educated. By but that's the same around amount of time, the same time period as when Jeremiah is in a pit yeah. prophesying the doom mm-hmm. of Israel. Plato yeah. is same kind of thing, doing his thing. Hmm. Well educated, which back then pr- means private teachers mostly, which means you know wealthy family. If you wanted your kid to be educated, you sent him to teachers that would teach him specific things. So he was well educated. What a concept. Um, yeah, uh-huh. he may have traveled broadly. We're not quite sure. In 404 and 403 BC, this was the reign of the oh. 30. You guys know about this? Oh, no. I was thinking where he tried to like start a utopian colony on Sicily. Right. That's not this? That's not this. Oh, okay. So right then, Athens, Athens was in decline after Pericles, right? The mm-hmm. golden age of Athens was falling off. And the Spartan-backed rule of 30 tyrants, these 30 people came into Athens and were just a completely tyrannical reign. Did of they reign at the same people. time, or was thirty people back to back? Thirty people all at the same time. It was like a council. Horrible. Yeah, and they selected. Really? I think it was three thousand Athenians that were loyal. Ended up killing just part. Sometimes just to take their stuff. Dang. Like it, sometimes it was because they didn't agree with their rules. Sometimes it was for political reasons. Sometimes they're like, "You have a nice house, and we want it." They ended up killing fifteen hundred Athenians which ended up to be about 5% of the Athenian population. Jeez, that's crazy. And then exiled a huge another chunk. I had no idea this happened. It's kind of, you know, I, it's kind of referred to like he was, one of them was like the first Robespierre. It was kind yeah, of like, yeah. the, like yeah, just yeah. Well, so like, many dead. Yeah. And, which when you intense. think of Plato, like whenever I think of Plato, I think, you know, sort of this urban man who lived a caref- not carefree life, but lived a, a life of, of peace and security right. and contemplation. Uh-huh. Right. And to think, nope. you know, yeah, crazy. Because I would have thought, I would have thought Plato lived in the golden age of Athens, not Mm -mm. immediately after it. And then, so during this time, many people, many Athenians fled to Piraeus, where the Republic is set. So that kind of may, you know, shine a little bit of info on why they set the Republic there instead of in Athens. Um, At 40 years old, he returned to Athens to found the Academy. Um, Throughout his later life, he was embroiled in the politics of Syracuse and was brought to sort of teach a tyrant Dionysius and was sold into slavery and then got bought out of slavery by another guy. And then he got rehired by Dion to teach Dionysus, Dionysius II, who rebelled and expelled his father. It was all this crazy stuff. So he's, he's lived a pretty crazy life. Um, hmm. But founding the Academy was one of the most important things he did. And I think it, I think it's uh, stood for around 400 years, something like that. Oh man, Sounds we got, like, Veritas has like a lot to live up to. Yeah. We've we been our, around for... Since 2000 and like, five? like 15 years, something like that. So we got a little longer in there. Yeah. Okay. That's our goal is to be the 400 academy. years. Yeah. 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 Okay. Heck yeah. And he died on his birthday and how old he was. There's some contention, but 
right around 81. Hmm. It's a good long life. Yeah, it's a good long life. So, listener, there's also this misconception that people in antiquity didn't live very long, right? That the life expectancy was like 40. But that's not... People weren't just living to 40. The reason that number is so low is partially because of infant death. So right? people live to 40 on average, but that's not helpful when a huge number of people die right. in infancy because that right. throws off your averages. Right. And you've got a whole bunch of diseases that no one knows how to treat, and mm-hmm. that'll bring your you know average survivability, survivability down. So it's not like when you hit eight, you're like, oh, I better start my vocation. Mm-hmm. Like if you hit eight, you're doing pretty good, and it's all likely that you'd grow up, right? Mm. The Spartans wouldn't allow you into the marketplace till you were 30. Hmm. And if you died at 40, that leaves like 10 years of useful market stuff. So people really did live a long time. It was just less likely. You're more likely to get a disease and kick it before, before then. So, all right, that's Plato's life. And, uh, oh man, I just managed to close my book. Ah, I reopened it. All right. (laughs) Sometimes when I finish a sentence, I like, well, like close my book summarily and then realize that I still need to have Actually it open. needed that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's get into big book one. And it starts with Plato and some buddies and they go out to see... You mean Socrates. Yeah, right. Sorry. Socrates is the main character here. You're right. It's Socrates, not Plato. So Socrates and some buddies, they're going to see sort of a parade in Piraeus and hang out. And then on the way back, a whole bunch of people stop him and say, you are going to come talk with us because there are a lot of us and there's only one of you. And you can't get away. And he's like, all right, it's all very good natured. That's logic right there. Yeah, they're not kidnapping him. They're like, you should hang out. Also, there's going to be this sweet race tonight. Have you heard about the torch race? He's like, no, I haven't heard about the torch race. Are they going to hand torches to each other on horses? And he's like, yeah, they're just going to ride around and hand a torch around. And he's like, that sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. Boy, I got to see that. So they go and they decide to spend some time hanging out prior to this horse race. And that's the sort of the premise for where the conversation starts. And there's this guy. We should do horse races. I was going to say, we do intramurals twice a week. Mm -hmm. Horse races could be a part of that. Yeah. So there's a guy, Cephalus. (laughs) Not... Poor guy. (laughs) Yeah, I was like... (laughs) Not Cephalus. Wait. wait. Cephalus. Okay. It's just a bummer of a name. I I don't think they had... He's itchy. Yeah, it's... (laughs) (laughs) Poor guy. Awkward funny, not yeah. ha-ha funny. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's ha-ha funny. That is awkward. <laughs> nope. nope, that's awkward funny. All right, so they, they start talking, and Socrates is like, hey, you're getting old. What's that like? He says this to Cephalus? Yeah, yeah. he's just kind of wondering in his in his old age and how, you know, is, is it true what he hears, that all these old guys are having a terrible time and it's all difficult and rugged, and he's like, I'm getting up there. I'm, you know, got to wonder what I'm looking forward to. That's pretty wise. I yeah. feel like you should always... It's a good question. Find people to ask what's what's coming next. Yeah. Yeah. So he replies with one of the most well-known quotes from the Republic. Mm-hmm. I've, I've actually read it in several other books, all sort of referring back to this. And he says, how well I remember the aged poet Sophocles in, when in answer to the question, how does love suit with age, Sophocles? Are you still the man you were? Do you still like, like the ladies? Peace, he replied. Most gladly have I, sca- have I escaped the thing of which you speak. I feel as if I had escaped from a mad and furious master. His words have often occurred to my mind since, and they seem as good to me now as the time when he uttered them. For certainly, old age has a great sense of calm and freedom when the passions relax their hold. Then, as Sophocles says, we are freed from the grasp not of one mad master, but of many. The truth is, Socrates, that these regrets and also the complaints about relations are to be attributed to the same cause, which is not old age, but men's characters and tempers. Hmm. For he who is of a calm and happy nature will hardly feel the pressure of age. But to him who is of an opposite disposition, youth and age are equally a burden. So he's like, yeah, all these guys are complaining, but that's just because they're cranks and they've been cranks for years. It's not that old age makes them cranky. It's just that they were always cranky. They're always a little cranky. They're not calm and peaceful. I mean, as the elder statesman of this podcast, I am here to tell you, lads, um, that it's true that with age, age the passions (laughs) mellow, they simmer. Mm-hmm. And uh, they they know they don't no longer clutch and grab at your soul, and um, but you enter into this well this serenity that you mm, see before you. Wow. So <laughs> that's wonderful. I'm sorry, I spaced out for most. <laughs> yeah, of that. I wasn't listening to anyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, so then he's like, "Hey, by the way, did you make your own money?" And the guy's like, "Yeah, I made some of my own money." And Socrates asked him that. Yeah. He's like, most of my fortune is self-made. And he's like, weird, because you're actually pretty fun to hang around. (laughs) And most people that make their own money are not fun to hang around. I got to read you this quote. Oh, that's so funny. Because it's one of my favorites. The makers of fortunes have a second love of money as a creation of their own, resembling the affections of authors for their own poems and of parents for their children. Besides that natural love of it for for the sake of use and profit, which is common to them and all men. And hence... 
they're a very bad company for they can talk about nothing but the praises of wealth, right? So you make your own money, just like an author makes his own poems. You have a certain attachment to it. It's true. Do you think that's true? Maybe. No. You don't think that's true? You don't think people who make their own money or? I think people who make their own. So I'm con, I'm contrasting people who make their own money versus those who are born into money. Is that the yeah. distinction mm-hmm. he's making? Uh, I think I prefer people who have made their own money. They at least, I mean, they did something like they earned that. Yeah. And so even though luck is a huge part of it, like they're, it's an interesting story how they made it. And I don't know. Yeah. They're hardworking. They're not, they don't have that same entitlement that some people can have if they're given everything that they have. So yeah, sure. I don't agree. But they're intense. Depends on how they made their money. Yeah. Yeah. So Socrates asks, well, what do you think is the greatest benefit you've gotten from your cash, right? Especially in your old age. The guy says, well, when you get old, you stop worrying about a lot of things and you start it's true. thinking about, well, you're going to, you're going to kick it soon. And so oh gosh. like, have you, have you wronged anybody? Have you done anything horrible to other people thinking about, you know, your, your relations and the things that really matter in life? And he says, um, the greatest thing it has given to me is hope. And then he quotes a guy. He says, hope, he says cherishes the soul of him who lives in justice and holiness and is the nurse of his age and the companion of his journey. Hope, which is mightiest to sway the restless soul of man. He pretty much says that having money means that I didn't have to worry about, you know, I didn't have occasion to defraud anybody. Mm -hmm. I I wasn't in poverty, so I had no reason to be a thief and to steal and to be a punk. And more than that, I've always given to the gods what what their due was, right? The sacrifices, because I was never too poor to give them. Mm -hmm. So he's like, for that reason... like, that's really nice. Not, I, I know that I was just in my dealings, partially because I had enough money to go around and I never had to be dirty about it. Right. And this quote, I think, is where everything begins in, in Plato, in the Republic. Because right there, cherishes the, soul, cherishes the soul of him who lives in justice and holiness. And that's the question that Socrates asks is, what do you mean by justice? What's justice? And that's the question that all of the Republic revolves around. And Cephalus is like, you know, oh, come I'm on. getting kind of tired. Yeah, yeah. Little man. <laughs> yeah. Well, he says it. He says... Uh, no, he gives a definition. He gives a definition. He says it's... Let me, let me see if I can find it. Um, is it uh, uh, give you, uh, um, helping your friends and hurting your enemies? Is that his definition? Well, Plato kind of asks, he says, justice, what is it? To speak the truth and to pay your debts? No more than this? Because that's what he implies, mm-hmm, right? I spoke mm-hmm. the truth. Yeah. I paid my debts. I didn't have to lie to anybody. And he says, is that all that justice is, is just paying your debts and speaking the truth? And so they kind of talk and he replies. And the, a better definition they give is for he really meant to say that justice is the giving to each man what is proper to him. And this he termed a debt, mm. right? Giving to each man what is proper. That's justice. How do you guys feel about that? Do you see any problems? Um, I think it's a pretty good definition of justice being giving what is owed. I don't know if I agree that it's a debt necessarily. I guess it's a debt in that it, if you say it's a thing that has to be paid, that makes it a debt. But yeah, justice is giving. Yeah. What is owed? That seems reasonable. It's hard. Yeah. It seems reasonable. I agree. I like it as a definition. It's hard to sort of figure out. Well, if you're trying to create a standard, um, um, I guess it, it is justice individually calibrated to each person versus can you have a, a just system, a just um, um, like Thomas, let's say that um, you know, you're in dire poverty and you steal to survive. Right. I am affluent and I steal just to be a punk. Mm. You would so there's one in one sense justice should be that we both get the same sentence because um, uh, we're we both e- did the same action. We both did the same action. Right. But, but in another sense, it would be more just if I, doing it out of just malicious intent, got a harsher sentence and you did it yep. and, and you got less uh, of a sentence. This is like Jean Valjean, right? Yeah, this sure. is this is Les Mis. Yeah. So I mean, um, which one is the true justice? In that situation. Yeah, so I guess, so AJ, to your question, a problem of using this definition is the fuzziness of it. So figuring out what that justice is and if it can be consistent. So that's what Graham, I think, is pulling out. Sure. Yeah. Well, this definition is bad, obviously, because Socrates is about to pull it apart. Like, otherwise, yeah. the book would just be over. Like, yeah. guys, we nailed it. Yeah. Like, we, we got it. And only a few pages into book one. Yeah. So there's some problems. Uh, the... Well, Cephalus, he, yeah, you're right. He's like, nah, I'm kind of tired. So he takes off and he <laughs> leaves other people yeah. to argue for him. And then... That's then, an old man move. I mean, yeah, like smart. that is... For sure. Mm-hmm. 
here's my opinion. I'm sleepy. <laughs> and then, so Plato takes it on and he says, okay, so if we're supposed to pay our debts, what Socrates. if you've... Socrates takes it on. Doggone it. Yes, Socrates. Socrates says... Plato through Socrates. Yeah, I mean, Plato it's through not Socrates. Really, yeah, it's not really Socrates. This is, yeah. It's like a retweet. Well, yeah. you're right. I, I'm, uh, wait, no. <laughs> okay. It's even worse than that. Oh, anyway. <laughs> the Republic, greatest retweets of all time. It's just <laughs> the, it's the worst. It's compendium. All right, so he says, okay, so Graham, say you're my buddy, right? Yeah. And you come and you're like, hey, would you do me a favor and hold on to these guns? I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll watch your guns for you. Thank right? you. I appreciate it. If you're, you know, if you're like moving and stuff and your new apartment doesn't really allow guns, guns mm-hmm. and then you're... Okay. And then Can you, you store my guns for a bit? Yeah, I, st- I store your guns. It's great. Mm-hmm. And then you go totally bananas. Like your brain breaks. Mm-hmm. You've been like eating cat food and you break what? all your what? relationships. <laughs> you break up with your girlfriend. And dude, she was great. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess you're married, so you, married. you divorce your wife and she, she's awesome. So mm-hmm. you're clearly insane and mm-hmm. you come and you're like, can I have back my guns? Mm-hmm. What would you term the guns other than a debt? I don't know. Okay. So, um, he's not owed the guns. I mean, I know it's his personal property. Uh, it is a debt that, he, that I owe him. Yeah, but it's. Give me my guns, maybe. Yeah, but you're insane, Graham. I'm not going to give you your guns. Like, so, uh, and maybe the deeper question is like, is this the same gram as before? Because in a significant way, it's not. I, I made a debt with reasonable Graham, who is a charming, wonderful person. And now crazy Graham is coming back and I don't like him. Like, I, so you're, you're not turning into debt because he's a different person. Yeah. DNA would say otherwise. Uh, that's complicated. The cells in your body change. Anyway, what, this is a different conversation, but in some significant way, he's not the same person he was before. Well, if, I mean, we could go way philosophical with yeah. it and say that moment to moment, moment, you're yeah, not the totally same person. The same person exactly. Right. So yeah. by that, you never have to pay down. any of your debts. And then every like society breaks down if we yeah, want to hang fine. out there. Yeah. Yeah, as long as he doesn't shoot people. I think. You anarchists. Yeah. But you're saying my, it all down. you're yeah, saying my, anarcho primitivism. So my, um, like my potential, my potentialities have changed. I'm, I have a higher potential for like crazy violence. Yeah. Um, so are you saying it's, it is just to not give me back my guns? Correct. How's that just? Maybe, maybe it's not just, maybe it's prudent, but it's uh, denying me justice. Maybe the, and I, I don't remember if this is in the Republic, but at some point the, the Socratic question is, you know, are there, are there one virtue or many virtues? And mm-hmm. so maybe that's my problem here is I'm conflating multiple virtues. So maybe mm-hmm. justice would say, give it back. Mm-hmm. Prudence would say, yeah, that, that prudence would say, don't you dare give. Well, if, if this is the definition of justice, uh-huh. certainly something is broken, mm-hmm. right? If the definition is flatly to play, pay your debts and uh-huh. this is clearly a debt, then, and you, you should not in your right mind pay it, right? It would yeah. not be just to do so. Just justice is simply paying your debts doesn't seem big enough to encapsulate what we feel like we mean when we talk about justice. Yes. Yeah, sure. Or justice is not operating alone. Like, yeah, justice needs to be paired with something. Oh, else. you're such an Aristotelian. Yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. Sorry. Anyway, here we are. Okay. And then they say, all right, well, what if it's just doing good to friends? And evil to enemies, right? What if that's the definition? Nah. Good to friends and evil to enemies. Nah. Because, like, there's a way of going too far in evil to enemies that is unjust, that is just cruelty. Or a way that when you say good to friends, it, uh, sometimes friends need to be challenged. They need um, something that would be, would look like bad, but is actually for their good. But that's for their, I mean, like you are doing good. It's just that they might be a little too short-sighted to see it. But there are other problems, what, right? The same of not, no, so what I would perceive as good, the friend might not perceive as good. What an enemy might perceive as good. You're like we, we run into the same problem of agreeing to what is good and bad. Uh, so we'll get there, the right uh, problems of perception. Yeah. The first problem is that like, say you're sick, right? Do you want a just man or do you want a really good physician, even if he's a little corrupt? Good physician? Yeah. Say you are going to go sailing. Mm -hmm. Do you want a just man? Like, would you rather have him or just someone that's really good at sailing, even if he's a little bit of a dirtbag? Dirtbag sailor. Can't I get a just and good sailor? Uh, It seems like a strange dichotomy. I mean, uh, maybe. Um, What if you uh, need to buy a horse? You want a guy who knows horses or do you want like, do you want me to come along? I'm pretty just. (laughs) Could I, could I come with you? You sure could. It'd have, we'd have a wonderful time. I would not buy that horse, but. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So Socrates is like, so it seems like justice is only good when you don't, need to do anything else like in times uh, of health and peace and not needing to buy horses that's the only time that justice is useful okay maybe yeah sure okay so so that's a, an extra complication and yeah. then he also says um so what if what if uh 
you are mistaken about who your friends are. Right. Right. Yeah. What if what if you think this guy's a friend and he's actually a he's sort of a dirtbag? Sure. Right. And you right. you do good to him while you're actually doing good to your enemies. Yeah, like and someone who doesn't give you your guns back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I stand by that one. Yeah, seriously, it's okay. Yeah, for sure. Did you just call me a dirt bag. <laughs> um, uh, AJ has my guns. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I definitely have his guns, and I'm <laughs> keeping them. And you're going to give them back? Yeah. So here, I'll, I'll read you a quote. So, but see the consequence. Many a man who is ignorant of human nature has friends who are bad friends. And in that case, he ought to do harm to them. And he has good enemies whom he ought to benefit. But if so, we shall be saying the very opposite of that, which we affirmed by the meaning of Simonides, right? Do good to your friends and evil to your enemies and that sort of thing. So he's, he's pretty much like, what if, if you're mistaken, that throws a whole wrench into the entire thing. And especially if you are, say, say I'm a thief, right? Are my friends good men? No. Well, if they're, are they thieves as well? Oh, they're, they are also men. thieves. Yeah, then they're not good men. Yeah, they're not good men. Are they my enemies? No, they're your friends. Didn't you just say that? Uh, but they bring me vice. Yeah. Like they're letting me live in this life as a thief. I mean, I mean this is what your mom says. You think they're your friends. <laughs> exactly. You yeah, think they're, they're yeah. your friends, but, but I am really, mistaken because yeah. they're doing harm to me. They're letting me live in a vicious life. Yep. So that's the problem, right? We want to do an extra problem there. And he also says, well, what about uh, doing harm to your enemies? Does that seem right? Should we injure no. anyone? No. And he says, okay, it's a fun little, fun little thought experiment. He says, when horses are injured, are they improved or deteriorated? Deteriorated. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Right. That is to say the good qualities uh, are, of horses are lost, not the qualities of dogs. Right. We don't lose dog qualities from the horse. We lose horse qualities from the horse. When Correct. We hurt it. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, and dogs aren't deteriorated in the good qualities of, are, are deteriorated in the good qualities of dogs and not of horses. Right. You hurt a dog, it loses its dogness. Yes. By how could it be otherwise, Socrates? Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is, so he's referencing that in the book, a lot of the people that listen are like, oh, like it can't be different. Of course. <laughs> of course. Why, yes, Socrates. Yes. That, that's, I can see no other way. Yeah. And then, <laughs> fantastic. I yeah. certainly don't disagree. Yeah. Um, and then he says, now, so if you injure a man, what kind of qualities does he lose? Manly qualities. Ma- yeah. And what quality is that? Well, just this. No, I don't. Well, just, yeah, well, that's what he oh, says. Okay. Right? You injure a man, he's going to lose a quality that's unique to men. And so therefore he loses justice and will act unjustly? Is that the point? Yeah. So, well, he's, his point is like, have you ever known any other art, right? The art of justice to injure itself, right? If the art of painting, like, does its job and then, ah, oh, painting is, itself is hurt. Like, oh, we make yeah. paintings worse. So like, how, can ju- how, can that, how can hurting your enemies be justice if it lowers the amount of justice, justice. in the world yeah. by acting? Exactly, yeah. Justice is kind of hurting itself, and yeah. it's, it's this huge big mess, and it doesn't work. And so we this clearly guy. should not render harm, right. so that doesn't work, yeah. and it's a problem. So they're, they're kind of stuck. And at this point, and this is one of my favorite things about book one, Thrasymachus pipes in. Mm-hmm. Do you remember Thrasymachus? I do remember Thrasymachus. What, what's he about? Um, is Thrasymachus the one that's, um, uh, so there's, I was confused with Glaucon. Glaucon is the favorable one, the one that yeah. loves Socrates. The Thrasymachus like, oh, is absolutely. kind of like, thinks Socrates is a punk and he comes in and he asserts like just terrible things. Justice like, is nothing else than the interest of the stronger. That's right. What yeah, are yeah, you yeah. looking at? Are you cheating? Are you every looking epi- stuff up? No, every, every episode I pull up the Wikipedia page. Oh, yeah, every really? time. Oh, yeah. my word. Well, that's what yeah, you're doing every back time. Yeah. You punk store. Yeah, like well, you're cheating. It. Now I'm going to ask a question. You'll be like, well, here's the answer. So it's not any Good. fun at all. Yeah. So Thrasymachus pipes up and he's like, he, he's just about had it for this mm-hmm. whole conversation. He's like, man, I flip and hate Socrates. And I really want to read it just to show you how entertaining all of this is. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but I'll, I'll talk about, I'll do maybe what he, what he says at first. What folly, Socrates, has taken possession of you all? And why do you knock under to one another? I don't know what that phrase means, nope, but me neither. You know, maybe it's lost knock to antiquity. Under. I say that if you want really to know what justice is, you should not only ask, but answer. You should not seek honor to yourself from the refutation of an opponent, but have your own answer. For there is many a one who can ask and not answer. And now I will not have you say that justice is duty or advantage or profit or gain or interest. For this sort of nonsense will not do for me. I must have clearness and accuracy. And then the narration says, I was panic stricken at his words and could not look look at him without trembling. Indeed, I believe that if I had not fixed my eye upon him, I should have been struck dumb. But when I saw his fury rising, I looked at him first and was therefore able to reply to him. 
And so he kind of talks about the knocking under thing. There are a lot of, in these platonic dialogues, some character just like has it with Socrates' questions <laughs> and like flips out and says similar things. He's just like, say what you think. Yeah. Because like, <laughs> Socrates is super annoying. Like, he really is. Yeah. And I think he would say that about himself, right? He says he's yeah, a gadfly. He's, he's, he's which is why annoying. I don't like, Socratic dialogues should be taught in middle school because yeah. every single middle schooler loves Socrates yeah, exactly. because they are Socrates. The way he asks the questions. Yeah, the way exactly. he asks the questions. I was actually going to point out that Thrasymachus reminds me of every snarky kid in every ninth grade class I've ever had who's like, well, what about this? You're yeah. doing this and not this. And he just, you know, wants to make me look like a fool. And That's true. He might sometimes because yeah. it might be. And so he says, Socrates is like, so you asked me to define justice, but you told me like five things that I couldn't say it was. That's like asking me to say what is 12, but I'm not allowed to say it's three times four or two times six or any of those. Okay. And the guy's like, those are not at all like, like, what a bad analogy. You're an idiot. And, and he's like, <laughs> he's, I'm not kidding. That's correct. So- Socrates is being a punk right now. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, well, those car- cases aren't at all like. Okay. And Socrates is like, look, if you want me to find the right answer, it might be one of those. You have to leave those open. Fair. Anyways, he eventually says justice is nothing else than the interest of of the stronger. This is Thrasymachus. This is Thrasymachus. Mm -hmm. And he kind of elucidates because Socrates is like, what? You mean like eating beef? So like a giant beefy guy? Uh. Like, So you're saying that like this other guy that eats a whole lot of beef Sorry, we should eat beef too because he's really strong. I know it's it's great. It's so annoying. That's fascinating though. Just to think about beef. No, just to oh. think that like even in the ancient world, like <laughs> that? the idea of of eating meat is oh. associated with strength. Yeah. Um, well, he's talking about one like really hefty guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, so this hefty guy eats a lot of meat. You think you should too? So like for anyway. me and you, right? Arnold uses like growth hormones. Therefore, that is justice. Is yeah. me and you getting growth hormones? And he's like, clearly not. That's not what I'm talking about. So here's the the view in extent. And the different forms of government make laws uh, democratical, aristocratical, tyrannical, with a view to their several interests. And these laws, which are made by them for their own interests, are the justice which they deliver to their subjects. And him who transgresses them, they punish as a breaker of the law and unjust. Mm, so he's saying it's a it's a, a relative thing. The people in power want to stay in power and they want to keep they want to develop some sort of system and perpetuate that system. And so they call what is healthy to the system just and what is unhealthy to the system unjust. Yep. yep. And that is all that justice is. Yep. Yes, he says, and that is what I mean when I say that in all states there is the same principle of justice, which is the interest of the government. And as the government must be supposed to have power, the only reasonable conclusion is that everywhere there is one principle of justice, which is the interest of the stronger. Right? So Mm -hmm. who makes the laws? Government makes the laws. The man. Yeah. Yeah. And the man is clearly out for himself. Yeah. So clearly that is what justice is. Yeah. Only the strong, right? They succeed. Gentlemen. There's nothing nothing new. We must rip this system. Uh, Rend thou the system. (laughs) Rend thou the system. What was the quote? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so Thrasymachus puts that out. How do you guys feel about that? That is a KMFDM reference, by the way, the listener. Mm-hmm. If you don't know who that is, mm-hmm. Google it. Yeah. Uh, what do I think about that? Yeah. Uh, it, it. Do they do they say how old Thrasymachus is? Well, he's, <laughs> uh, it just seems like <laughs> you think he seems young. He's some, some punk he's young kid. He's like, yeah. Yeah, just can't, like he can't he's get written, once. He's like so, carving yeah. anarchy symbols. No, in he the just wall. like he read Noam Chomsky for the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he read ancient Noam Chomsky and he's like, yeah, it's like the world, the worst. Yeah, it's like, yeah, he wants to tear the system down and thinks his system is better. He's like, like have you guys heard of socialism? Yeah, he, <laughs> like, oh, okay, he's yeah. back to his like small town from being in college uh-huh. for summer. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like he, he learned. He read like one book in college. And he's coming back to be edgy about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, that's the Shemekis. Yeah. Anyway, you guys ever heard of Atlas Shrugged? <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, that is uh, that is what I think of Thrasymachus. Yeah. <laughs> what do you... <laughs> He's my brand new favorite character. Uh, how do you guys feel about his concept? It's dumb. I mean... Uh, uh, it's cynical. It is cynical, yes. So, uh, in saying that there is one singular justice, but that justice is, like, corruption, essentially, in mm-hmm. every state, like... It's a cynical statement. It it allows him to not have to ask questions or learn about justice. He can just say, whatever is the norm here is bad because it is established only by power. Mm-hmm. So, But he seems to think that it's great. Like being powerful is awesome. So mm-hmm. might as well be powerful and have your definition of justice be yeah. justice. Sure. But it's, it, it, it is an amoral, immoral, I guess, immoral stance to say that it's it's only for the sake of power, that there's no 
actual good inside of justice. It's if it's true, all it sets up in this world is is conflict. It's, yeah. it's power struggles power struggle, between right. between different ideas of justice. Right. Um, so you're saying it's like the evolutionary theory of justice. Yeah, yeah or it's I mean, and the, or the very Nietzschean will to power. Like what you need to be doing is is you know getting your own power base and. Uh, yeah, and being able to survive, get your tribe, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's it's like like I said, it's cynical. It's, um, yeah, it's it's just um, force. Yeah, force it's, against force. It's just force. So, of course, Plato has ways to poke holes in it, right? Mm-hmm. Plato, or sorry, Socrates. Socrates pokes holes with more logical means. He says, "Okay, so uh, do governments always make perfect laws? No, always in their interest." No. no. Has the government ever made a law that is not in its own interest? Totally. Yes. Yeah, they could do stupid things. Okay. But not even, or if government can pass laws about regulating itself. I mean, so there's also that. Like you know. keeping interest rates perpetually low for <laughs> generations. No, the Federal Reserve is entirely separate from <laughs> the government. What are you talking oh, about? Oh, that's fair. It's totally independent. You're right. Yeah, they, they have no sway that's, over each other. That's actually kind of crazy when you think about it. Anyway, let's get it. So he says, well, what if they're, you know, <laughs> if they're. about that. No, sorry. If what's the interest of the stronger in that case would be to disobey the law they have given. Mm-hmm. So clearly your definition is a little bit goopy, right? If if true justice would be to disobey the laws instead of obeying the law, like obeying the laws that the stronger has well, given. Well, this is the problem when you have it be relative. Everything, like the more it plays itself out, then it just comes down to each man is a decider or a creator of justice of for him and right. herself. Mm-hmm. Right. And so then there is no justice. And so then there is no justice or, or there's, um, or everything's justice or whatever. So Thrasymachus is like, all right, fine. I see, I see they could make laws that don't really, you know, are in their own interest. But in that case, I would say that they are an imperfect ruler, right? They're not doing, they're not being strong in that yep. moment. And, and so it's not the interest of the strong. In that case, it's the interest of the weak. And then they're Socrates says, up. what do you appeal to to say that they're imperfect? No, yeah. actually Socrates kind of takes it a left turn. Hmm. Socrates says, okay, all right, so fine. Maybe he's not strong when he makes laws against himself. But let's consider the art of ruling, right? But first let's consider other arts. So if you're a shepherd, what are you concerned with? Your sheep. Your sheep. Yep. If you're an Healthy artist, sheep. what are you concerned with? Your art. your art. Your art. What about if you're a physician? Who do you care about? Patient. Your patient. Not yourself. No. It's not for your interest. Well, I get paid. Well, that's a separate thing completely. Mm-hmm. The, the art of mm-hmm. the physician, who is it? Oh, the, the actual thing that you are practicing, um, you're not a good physician if at the end of it, you feel great. <laughs> But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're not, you are not necessarily like the, the art of being a physician or the art of medicine uh-huh. is concerned with healing the patient, mm-hmm. right? right? The art of the, the captain, right? Is, is his sailors, right? Yeah. He wants to make sure that the sailors are doing their thing and the boat goes well. And he is always concerned with his subjects, uh-huh. not himself. What about the art of a ruler? Same, the subjects, right? The, the you're, you're saying the ruler should be concerned for like, um, happy, healthy subjects. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so his interest isn't in himself. His interest is it shouldn't be firmly in the subjects. It should is be. it not? Is it always no? It should be in for the people he yeah. rules over. He's saying ideally that's what it should be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you dis you dis like it should be. That's that's what ruling ah. is. But mm-hmm. that that so shows justice. the problems. Like if yeah. you are a perfect ruler, yeah. you are perfectly concerned only with your subjects rather than yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the interest your interest is in your subjects. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So well, your interest is in a healthy system. Yeah. And a healthy system. I mean, system you is are also of part subjects. of it. But yeah. You're part of it too. So like a well, healthy sure. system benefits you, but it doesn't. Unless just, you're a tyrant, yeah, in but, which case you're a little outside. Mm-hmm. Okay. How do you think Thrasymachus replies to this? That's a great ideal, but rulers actually only care about power. Another cynical statement. Yeah. Kind of. You guys want to hear it? It's yeah, great. Sure. He gets really sassy. When we got to this point in the argument, and everyone saw that the definition of justice had been completely upset, Thrasymachus, instead of replying to me, said, Tell me, Socrates, have you got a nurse? (laughs) Why do you ask such a question, I said, when you ought rather to be answering? Because she leaves you to snivel and never wipes your nose. She's not even taught you to know the shepherd from the sheep. Oh, burn. (laughs) What makes you say that, I replied. Because you fancy that the shepherd or cowherd fattens or tends to the sheep or oxen with a view to their own good and not to the good of himself or his master. Hmm. And you further imagine that the rulers of states, if they're true rulers, never think of their subjects as sheep and that they're not studying their own advantage day and night. 
Oh no, and so entirely astray are you in your ideas about the just and unjust as not even to know that justice and the just are in reality another's good. That is to say that the interest of the ruler and the stronger and the loss of the subject and the servant. So he basically says, and he goes on to describe how the just, right, you and I, when we go to the marketplace, we're probably going to come out the worse other than an unjust man, hmm. right? Wait, but why? Because he's going to steal from us. Oh, okay. Right? Mm -hmm. The guy who follows the rules comes out the bottom on all of it. Right. And so who's he really serving except the guy at the top? Right? It's yep. the interest of the stronger. That's that's the the system, right? And so he he basically says, like, you think that it's for the benefit of the sheep, but clearly it's for the benefit of the guys at the top, right? That's the system good point. is Especially the system the is one. Yeah. all for the top. And then uh the way that Socrates replies is a little bit goofy. He says, okay, well, let's, let's make sure, because, you know, the, the interest of the shepherd is to eventually get fed, right? Mm -hmm. right, And to be for his master. And he says, uh-uh, those are separate arts. The art of getting paid is the art of pay, is Socrates' reply. Yeah. It's the same. It's the same with the phys physician. You can imagine someone who's only in it for the money. So yeah, they they're good at curing people, but they only care about the money on the other side. But you could be a bad physician, but good at the art of pay, in that you've made it look a like the person's healthy, right? healthy. Yeah. and they're like, oh, I feel great. But then they go home and they fall apart. Yeah, that is true. Um, and, and you could like, I don't know, put really nice makeup on the sheep when you mm -hmm. sell them, and someone's like, ooh, <laughs> and you're really <laughs> good, good at the art yeah, of wow. pay, the art of swindling, but yeah, you're a bad right. shepherd. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he kind of separates the two. He separates that personal interest from the actual art mm. of ruling, which seems, to me, that doesn't seem like as strong a reply as it Socrates could be. does that? He's yeah, that's mm -hmm. Socrates. He's, he's saying, well, that's a separate thing, mm -hmm. right? The actual true art of ruling is paying attention to the subject, right? Sure, okay. Kind I mean, of. I agree with that as the ideal. I could, but Thrasymachus could just come back and say, no, it's not, or they, or... Uh, politics also splits those two goals. One is the caring for people. One is the gaining in power. People who are rulers want to gain power. They don't actually care about the subject. Yeah. Like, surely not. So it doesn't, it doesn't go all the way. And he's like, I probably haven't convinced you guys. And everyone's kind of like, they're sort of still flip flopping on this argument here. And he's like, all right, all right, all right. All right. Who says this? Socrates? Yeah. Socrates is like, let's, let's tally their advantages and disadvantages. Let's talk about each one. Like, we'll do like a, uh, like a little, the chart, a pro -con right? List. Pro con yeah. list. And he says, okay, we need to be clear about our terms. And he's like, what would you exactly would you call the just here? And he's like, sublime sim simplicity, right? Hmm. Just people are just simple. And what about injustice? He says, discretion, right? Because hmm. Socrates tries to define him as justice is virtue and injustice is vice. Hmm. And he's like, that's not, that's not fair because for my definition, sublime simplicity is justice and injustice is discretion, hmm. right? And so he's like, okay, would you say that the, how much does the just man desire? Does he want more than his he wants exactly friends? Like the, the other just people, does he kind of want to get one over on them and have more no, than everybody? No, he wants what is, what is appropriate. Due? What is due? Okay. What about the unjust man? How much does he want? He wants more. More. Everything. More than the unjust. More than other unjust men. Yes. Presumably, yeah. Yeah. More than other just men. Yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, for sure. Right? He wants he wants everything. Those rubes. <laughs> yep. Oh, what a bunch of what a bunch of bros. Yeah. What? And so he says Some jabronis. Oh. So, look at these oh. jabronis. And then he says, "Okay, what about say a uh, a musician? If you're a musician, do you want to have more skill at tuning strings more. than other musicians? Yes, more. of course, of course you do. You want to be excellent. But other like you want to go beyond all other musicians in tuning a string." No, no. You want beyond beyond well, all other musicians in the beauty and of your music, or if if you can get an edge in tuning and you're more like. But the thing is, at some point, something's in tune, and it's not like, it's not something that continues exponentially with skill. Yeah. So at some point, it's yeah. just done. Mm -hmm. You're there. You you've reached the pinnacle, right? Sure. What about? Uh, do you want to have better skill at tuning an instrument than say an unmusical person? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about physicians? Does a physician want to go further than the health of his subject? No. Super further health. than the health? Yeah. Well, like, uh, other, so we're all physicians. Oh. Yeah. We can all fix, like, uh, let's say a busted leg. Yeah. Right? Do I want to go, like, no, you do want I want to... way more than all other physicians in, like, fixing a busted leg? No. So, like, you want the, well, the person to be healthy. Right. And healthy is a 
is a balance. Yeah. Healthy is a yeah. is is a, a status. There's there's one way to be healthy and a million different ways to be unhealthy. unhealthy yeah. So I'm saying more that like uh, you know if if AJ and I are really good at like busted legs that um, have you know someone's kicked you in the leg and we can fix that, but Graham can like fix when they get stabbed. Like, but that's not further than health, right? It's just I'm better at getting you to health faster yeah, or but, when you have more extreme trauma. Yeah. So I get, yeah. So we would not want to go beyond health. I think is where we're, what we're landing on. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. What about, uh, what about a shepherd? Do you want to, do, know, do you want, do you desire to, uh, that's, that's probably a bad analogy, but to like go beyond in shepherding and just have yeah. like healthy sheep, healthy sheep, or you could have my sheep that can juggle. <laughs> I've gone beyond. Yeah, yeah, you want juggling yeah. sheep. Well, that sure. goes beyond probably shepherding, right? Yeah. Now you're no, now you're a ringmaster. Right. No, no. Shepherd ringmaster. Oh, you. So then he kind of says, that "Okay, pun. No. do shepherd ringmaster. Do the you. wise oh, you? Oh, oh, okay. <clears throat> so answer me this, boys. Do the wise and ha ha funny? Yeah, you guys <laughs> are doing a lot of talking over me. Oh, sorry, we're just talking about our you humor here, sorry. boys. Just kidding. All right, <clears throat> so answer me this." Do the wise and good desire to gain more than other wise and good men? Yes. I mean, I know what he's getting at. He's, he's going to say no, because w- wisdom and goodness is akin to, is an art akin to shepherding, or shepherding and physician and, and music. Tuning a string, right? Yeah. Once, once you're wise, you don't necessarily, like, you can't go any further. You're yeah. wise. You're right? wise. You can't be super wise. But you do want to be, mo- you do want to have more wisdom than the unwise. Yes, of course. Right? What about the unwise person? He wants more than... The unwise. Well, yeah, and... He wants to be wise. Does he? Yeah. Wow. The unwise wants to be wise? Or the... So I think maybe more Only if he was already wise, wise but he wanted to be wise. Place, right, yeah. If oh, realized, my goodness. You realize he had no wisdom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. So maybe okay. my, the desire here is not necessarily for wisdom, but for, like, money and worldly goods, right? Sure. Do oh, I sure. want yeah. Do I want to find more money and worldly goods yeah. than yeah. other wise men yeah. have probably gotten there? Mm. Uh, probably not. Unwise, yeah. They mm-hmm. want to... They wanna, get it all right and the bad and ignorant desire to gain more than both and if you say but then he's like but we said thrasymachus that the unjust goes beyond both his like and unlike were these not your words right and the just will not go beyond his like but only the unlike his point is there's a standard that you hit and that you don't you don't want to go beyond it because you or you can't go beyond it right that Mm -hmm. that wise men hit yeah, a certain point and want to go no further. And it's unwise and ignorant men that want more than everyone yeah. in every case. It's it's showing that like the people who've actually got the skill, who have the art, don't necessarily need to go further than everyone else around them. They, they sort of have it. And that the men who don't, they're the ones that desire the whole, the whole world, right? They want to go, they want more than they're like and more than they're unlike. And so he shows your definition, right? Is basically marrying your kind of person, the unjust yeah. person with, with the lower tier in all of these, right? The bad physician, the bad shepherd, the bad everything. Gotcha. Okay. So how do you feel about that? I've always liked that argument. I remember when I read it first in undergrad, I found that to be quite clever and convincing. There's some other arguments with Socrates in there that are, feel like he's just playing a little word game. And you're like, wait, gosh darn minute, Socrates. Yeah. But with that one, that, that, that idea that um, the just man or the good man or the wise man has reached some place of satisfaction and that the in unjust, the unwise in his art, yeah. in this art of, of virtue mm-hmm. or the, this facet of virtue. And then the unjust, the unwise, um, always is hungry, always wants, always wants more and doesn't reach this sort of level of satisfaction. Well, it just shows, me, a, it shows a lack, yeah. right? If yeah, you yeah. want more than everyone else, even your own kind, you are, you are lacking something, right? There is some something sort of deep in you that isn't there, and yeah. I mean it's a it's a weird analogy, and we could go on to talk about it for a long time. But it's interesting, yeah. But, Which is why I've always hated the like always be hungry, like mm-hmm. always strive after more kind of like self helpy. Yeah, I don't think that's, answers because to me that because for this very reason that seems like um. I don't know, it, like, but there's a satisfaction in achieving things also, and so. For some, so if one of you two came to me and was like, "Hey, Thomas, I think I've achieved wisdom, and I'm never gonna <laughs> pursue wisdom again," I'd be like, "You're probably an idiot." Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or, well, that would be demonstrating that he wasn't. Or the wise. physician saying, yeah. I'm, "I'm good enough at fixing legs." It's like, oh, I don't want to go to that physician. Like, there's so so. I think, I think maybe we're convoluting it and saying like wants more in his art. Uh, uh, let's let's talk about this. So, yeah. so. You two, I generally regard as wise men, 
right? Both of you. But Graham takes first place, right? Clearly. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. 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 You thought I was going to put you on part with it? <laughs> not not going to happen. And you boys have shown your wisdom. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Okay, good. You, you aren't really <laughs> desiring to go beyond the traits that he has secured for himself, right? His, he is content. He is intelligent. He has, he has purpose. Like all of those things are not things that you want to leave behind in pursuit of something else. Correct. Right. So you don't want more than your like, right? Yeah. Than, than another wise man. If I see another wise man over there and I'm like, ah, that guy is content. He has a great family. He knows his purpose. He knows all of those things. I'm not like trying to get more, get more all the time. You're trying to hit this standard. Yeah, I'm trying to hit a standard. <laughs> and the standard is clearly Set by Graham, Graham Donaldson. Yeah, exactly. Set by yeah. Graham Donaldson. Yeah. That's what I've always said. Yeah. Yeah. And I think but, I think that's interesting. It's even biblical, right? The only, there are very few places in the Bible that talk about, you know, always be hungry. And those are the run the race, right? Mm-hmm. Run the but race I, as, you know. But the thing runner. is like, is there ever truly is there ever truly a settled, content, wise man? No, I, I don't know how I feel about this. Honestly, like part of me says there, sh- there, there is. It's probably, but it, or is it just somebody that's um, kind I of think, relinquished desire for other things? Yeah, I think I, you have to say that there is no perfect wise man because sure. we're sinners. Yeah, man. exactly. Like, and, but that's what demonstrates the lack. Like, mm-hmm. that's the uh, exception that proves the rule. We don't have we don't have perfectly wise men because none exist because we are all broken. Yeah, showing that this argument is pretty good. But that's also why. I think the better advice for most people is to keep momentum and to keep moving and to keep doing because to stop is death or to stop is, but I think ah, the point is like, it's not just once move. you reach content, contentment, like maintain that commit, content. Like, is that, I just, I just can't not, it's not just moving of anything. Like right. we're kind of conflating it just to say like, you know, keep, keep hustling. And then there's no definition to hustle. So, I mean like there's a huge difference between, keep accumulating world uh, monetary goods ah, yeah. and also keep practicing humility, sure. right? Like, the, sure, the, you sure, know, sure. Um, so it's not just momentum there. It has to be momentum and trajectory. Sure. Like it, it has there to, has be to be a direction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, sure. So that kind of draws the, you know, draws to a close book, book one. number one. And in book one, they kind of get to the end and they're like, well, <laughs> we everyone's sort of sitting around in this circle going like, well, flip, we have no idea what justice is. And that's a great place to end it because yeah. then that's they crack open a six pack and they're like, all right, boys, let's get let's, to the bottom of this the nitty gritty. We're getting into it. Uh-huh. And that's what they do. I mean, they don't have anything to do until this crazy torch race on horses, which mm. I would really love to see, mm-hmm. but do they're they going to describe the torch race. I don't know. Mm. Okay. I no. it's, it's been a long time since, since I've actually like read Republic all the way to the end. I can't remember how it ends. I know I've, I've tried three or four times to get through the whole thing. And I always, I always peter out somewhere in the middle and yeah. I'm, I'm excited. Like one of the now reasons I'm doing this right. is because, this will force me to get all the way through. Because at some point it's like, you know, Socrates says, well, and that's why we should never teach children music. Yeah. <laughs> or, poetry. or we should tell, this one's my favorite. We should tell all our warriors that their blood is gold. Yeah, so they so won't they don't steal everyone stuff. else's yeah. gold. Yeah. <laughs> you like listener, you don't even know what you're getting into. I'm so excited. And I probably butchered a lot of these early arguments. It was no, a lot to get good. through. And I'm summarizing a lot of like nuanced stuff here. So I'm sorry if it came out garbled. But this you, is the one where Socrates will tell us like the ideal city and it's this nightmare sounding city. That's the Republic. It's a fabulous sounding city. It, uh, okay. I guess we'll get to that at yeah. some point. Yeah. Ruled by a philosopher king. Uh-huh. Based on a lie. Children uh-huh. are all common. I yeah. think. Are they, yeah. they're raised in common. Boys, there's no distinction between boy and girl. Aren't they just like all raised in common? Doesn't it sound like Brave uh, New World? I don't think, I don't oh, think that's mind. part of it. <laughs> okay. never mind. Uh, it's, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it well, there's no distinction in skill. Like if right. there is a girl who's oh, better for a job, she gets oh, the job. Oh, oh, I think it's it. at okay. some, but there's also like until you're seven, everyone's raised by women. And then after seven, everyone's raised by men. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's raised in common. And, and when you have a baby, like you put them, pretty much put them in this big pool of babies. Uh-huh. And then, yeah. so you never know which kid is yours. And then yeah. they're all sort of like redistributed yeah, so for people to world. raise. Yeah. yeah but surely like, you know, you're looking at that kid's nose and you're like, that kid, that's my, that's <laughs> probably my kid. <laughs> Weirdly enough, it's really similar to ancient Sparta. Ooh. Oh, that's interesting. The Athens that's idea fascinating. of Sparta. Interesting. Yeah. That's, uh, Socrates, uh, just society is the, is, is, Sparta. is early Sparta oh, huh. fan- because they Absolutely. raised, they raised all their kids cool. in common, mm, yeah. right? They were, they learned from everybody in the city and women had a lot of power in that society. And I don't know, this is, a, I think he's another instance of showing that not all ancient folks thought women were only suited for the kitchen. Sure, sure. Sure. Plato argued that any position in the state should be held by a woman. If the woman is better suited to it, if I can remember, right. Did he also, if I'm remembering yeah, correctly, yeah, yeah, I think I, I am, to remember that. but yeah, I could find out I'm wrong. We'll, we'll I get to that back part. through. We'll, we'll get, we'll get, cool. yeah, we'll get there. That'd be cool. 
So anyway, thanks for you know listening. Yeah, that's good. Um, so are you convinced, Megby? Are you now a uh, platonist? No. Well, we haven't team. actually landed on any definitions yet. Uh, we just torn two questions is really annoying. Yeah, I agree with but that. But you can begin <laughs> to see how Aristotle eventually would say these things like justice, wisdom are means between extremes. Mm-hmm. And then you're trying what you're trying to do is get to that balanced state of the golden mean as opposed to Thrasymachus is saying it's always power. more, more, more power, power, power. Yeah. That kind of thing. So yeah. he would also say it in a lot less fun way. <laughs> yeah. Arist- what? Listener, Aristotle, I, I, I've tried. It's so hard to read. Well, we've talked about this. Though. Yes. What, the Aristotle, what we have of him are mostly notes yeah. other people took on his material. Oh, so we don't get like, I mean, he, we don't think he did dialogues, but like, you know, we get a really good story when we read Plato at whatever. Yeah, it's like zero, As, zero to one. Yeah. The Peter it's like Thiel, Peter Thiel's yeah, lecture notes. notes yeah. on a <laughs> set of lectures Peter Thiel did. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically what we have of Aristotle, which is why... Again, imagine your ninth graders, AJ, are taking notes on your class, and Woof. like that's what we get of your thought. Like, yeah. Oh, it would say like you know, poop. Yeah, that, and also like, <laughs> Do you like initial me? plus initial <laughs> equals heart, and you know that kind of thing. It's like, wow, AJ um, Hindenburg's deepest which, words. You yeah. know, if you haven't been in Mrs. high school, Chris Hemsworth. If you haven't been in <laughs> high school for a long time, there is still like initial plus initial equals heart yeah. on quizzes and stuff. I like, love it. Kids are still doing that yeah. which is kind of nice one of my favorite things i ever discovered i i always if i see crumpled notes on the floor i oh. read them every oh, 100%, time 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. it's gold and i found i found one where two people were c- obviously conversing back and forth about who should go to prom together <laughs> and they're like jennifer and ryan and be like crossed out no not ryan ew <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> taylor <laughs> oh yeah taylor's no, these are made up names yeah 100 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah um but yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> good stuff. All right. I, I'm, I I'm excited for the series. Yeah, I want to do at least as much, at least we can at least get to book four. That's what is I'm that hoping the for. Get the cave and all oh, that stuff. I, yeah, I might have to go to other stuff in between. I'll probably toss some other ones mm-hmm. in there, but I'm hoping to do this whole series so that eventually good you can have you. a resource to go all the way through. That'd well, cool. um, have we got any classical stuff we got wrong? We definitely had a bunch of emails about the Greek uh, uh, word of discipline, virtue, of discipline and the, and the uh, Latin word of discipline, talking about erite and talking about wirus or wirus or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I still haven't even fully digested all of them to be able to make a classical stuff we got wrong statement. But clearly about- we need to learn Latin and Greek is, I think, the... Yeah. Yeah. The, the takeaway is either... So I guess the main takeaway is AJ feels vindicated. Do you want to sing the song? No, no, go oh, for the love of... Dashboard Confessional no, sings it better not. than I do. No, that's impossible. Uh, that's ha-ha awkward. <laughs> as is our entire podcast. <laughs> we received a number of emails from people helping us to think even further about Disciplina, uh, it, uh, that even the the etymology of the weirtus that I was talking about last time means something different than virtue when we use that word now. I guess it's the simplest yeah. way to talk about that. So I, I thought there were great emails. Is there any... No, that's okay. good. Yeah. We've also instituted, apparently, um, classical reviews we got. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, got. the one that I read earlier. But yeah. we can't no, just sure. read all the good ones. We have to, we have to well, accumulate some, some we bad did. ones. We have yet to have read a good one. We read one. We've, only, <laughs> we've read that one. Well, that, yeah. So if I'm reading this right, that's our only non-five-star written Oh, review. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, fwing, fwing, fwing. so give us some more... <laughs> Give us more reviews, but only make them five-star, please. And be honest. No, if we've learned anything about justice, is uh, yes, that we should we be do. given what we are no, due. No, that, that was the first definition that was shot down. Oh. No, it's, so, the, it's that the review is the stronger, and we are simply <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, serving that, the stronger. Yeah, we're the I just men, and we're a bunch of stronger, so is, apple. A, yeah. is a Malthusian game of power. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> this is miserable. Okay. Well. Anyway. This has been Classical Stuff You Should Know uh, with AJ, Graham, and Thomas. You can email us at classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. You can find us at classical... St- no, wait, no. You can find us at classicalstuff.net. Yes. You can tweet at us at classicalstuff, C-L-S-S-C-A-L, stuff, uh, on Twitter. Um, and if you do that, I will I will uh, like and retweet things that you send to us. Um and yeah, we appreciate uh, all of the feedback we get. Um, we try to get back to you. I know there's a backlog of some emails in there of things that we haven't that we haven't got to, but um, but we appreciate uh, hearing from you guys. And well also, said, Owen Wilson. Yeah, exactly. Oh my goodness, we can talk about that later. Such a, I love that email. Yeah, we we got an email because we always talk about you know what we look like and for you to imagine us as these strapping young men. And we got an email that tried to describe what we look like based on our voices. And it was it was a delightful email. It was pretty spot yeah. on, I would think. 
Uh, I ended up being Lightning McQueen, which is an animated car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is that is true. Um, AJ was some Young like and early like, 2000s yeah. uh, Xeno Warrior Princess spinoff character. Yep. Um, Richard and, Cipher? Does that sound right? Yeah. And uh, um, Thomas Magby was Hans Gruber, Hans Gruber himself yeah, yeah, the man from... Himself. From Die Hard. The so. best Christmas movie. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, anyway, so this is class of stuff, stuff you should know. Um, we thank you for listening, and we will catch you next time. Bye. Next time. Bye.